Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. There's a cat over here. There's a cat, There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cast catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have another amazing guest. She's done cats a few times regionally, but was first a swing in Joey Lorem on the U.S. National Tour 5 of Cats. So welcome, Lucy Horton, and thank you for joining me. I'm excited to have you because I love regional theater experiences of cats because they're usually pretty wild, to be honest. Um, so we will get there, and we will get to your experience on tour, on the fifth tour, I think is the number that they call it. That went on for a long time, but I always got to start in the beginning because you did the musical in 2009, I believe the first time. So you probably had that era of having the 1998 movie, but what was your first introduction to Cats? My first introduction to Cats was when I booked the tour. I had never seen the movie. Okay, no, I had nothing. never seen the show. Um, I grew up in... Um, in Connecticut, about an hour outside of New York. So we had had, you know, all the now and forever commercials, you know, the commercials for the Winter Garden, for Cats at the Winter Garden and um, and all of those things. So I, you know, knew it was an hour away in New York, but we never went. I didn't grow up dancing, so it was never kind of on my radar. Um, and I so knew, you knew it. it, but you had no idea. I, yeah, like you and, just you know, knew it exists. There, at least when I was in, you know, high school and into college, there's a subset of folks that, you know, laugh at the mega musical and Cats being the first mega musical. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, you know, rife for a little bit of uh, ribbing. So, yeah, it never really cr crossed my radar until I booked it. And then I remember like the day after I booked the tour and I sat down and watched the movie and I literally thought to myself, what have I gotten <laughs> myself into? <laughs> yeah. So I guess when you're, I always am interested to hear your experience in the audition of that, because if you're not familiar with it, I'm sure you're auditioning for everything at the time, right? You're going through a lot of auditions. Do you, how much like research do you do about a show when you're going into it? It's like, did you look into a lot of cats or was it just, this is one of the list of auditions I'm going to go to. And then you look in once you get, once you book it. These days I do a lot more research, uh, back then. I was, you know, I was, I was young. I was fresh on the scene. I was like, oh, let's just show up to this, see what happens. So I went into, it was a singer call, I believe first. And then they had me come back to dance and I did my best again, was not, yeah. did not grow up doing ballet, did not grow up doing a whole load of dance, a little bit here and there, not a lot. And, uh, wrote it off. And then it was, it was funny because I, I kind of wrote it off and, and, um, booked another show and then I got a call while I was going up to do this other show I was right after I graduated college and I got an offer for the tour and I said I'm sorry I can't I booked another job and so turned it down and then and that was they offered me Jelly Lorem for the 2008 tour and then I got another call in maybe February of that year saying hey we have an opening again for Jelly Lorem do you want to come out and join us and I said I just booked another show I can't so it was twice I had to turn it, so down, turn it down the same twice. year. And then they came back to me one more time and said, hey, we don't have Jelly Lorem, but we have the vocal swing who covers Jelly Lorem and Grizabella and mm -hmm. Jenny Andy Dots. Would you be interested? And I said, yeah, sure. Let's go on the road. So that was what's the time period between I, I, you said it was maybe six months ish from the first to the second. Or was it the next like group that was going out? Yes. Yeah, so the time? the first two times was the the year. The way that it worked at the time was it was almost like um, um, the tour is kind of continual with a bit of a summer break. So it was basically yeah. like almost like an academic school year calendar, which was very strange, but it worked out pretty well. Um, so it was the sort of August, September time of 2008 is when they initially asked me to do it. They called me back again in like February to have me go out in like April, which I also couldn't do. And then they called me again and I think it was like maybe july to go out again that fall um and because so many folks had um said yes to going back to a second year from the 2008 year there were maybe only 12 of us that were new so our actual uh introduction to the whole process was was 
a little bit different than I think a lot of other folks' experiences were. Um, you know, it was 12 of us in a room with the uh, associate choreographer, Suzanne Viverito, and we were kind of given, it was a bunch of swings that were new. And so we were each given like one cat to focus on. And then about two weeks yeah. later, they had the rest of the company come and join us to put the rest of us in, uh, which was different from other tour experiences that I have had since, but I guess not super dissimilar to being put into a show, but it was from a whole rehearsal standpoint. Yeah. So who were you focused on? I was focused on, was on Jelly at first. Um, and then when everybody came back, sitting on the sidelines, taking notes on everybody else. Yeah. Okay. I want to go back. You said you had this, like, what did I get myself <laughs> into moment? Walk me through that. Like, you're watching it now. You're watching yep. this 1998 yep. movie. And you, all you know is now and forever <laughs> yeah. commercial. What was your experience at that first, first view? first view of watching the 98 VHS, which I think... I had like I rented it on net on Netflix, you know, got the DVD mailed to me or something. And um oh. back in the old <laughs> days. <laughs> and I sat down and watched it and I was yeah, I think it was in that probably the first like 10 or 15 minutes seeing, you know, the 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 breakout of all these cats doing the same choreography and waves and in the opening number and then doing the naming of cats and they're all whispering in this really creepy way and going all over the place. I was like, what am I, I don't know if I can do this. Like, and I have to, I have to learn three of them. Like, what do I, where do I start? Yeah. How do I do? Oh my God. I was so, yeah, I was like, it was this, this, this whole feeling of like, I, what did I sign myself up for? How did they choose me? And what do I do if I can't do it? So it, some of that is, some of that is like the general, <laughs> you know, the general fear of going into a new project. But for me being relatively fresh out of school and feeling very fish out of water it was yeah it was daunting but i said i'll do it we'll figure it out and uh, i'm really glad that it, it would have been really easy to be like you know what no i'm not gonna i'm gonna I'm, I'm out um but i'm really glad that i didn't because it it really did change my life and the course of my career yeah yeah did you have a moment this is i mean i'm projecting my own moment onto you i want to know if you had the same experience but there is the moment of like, you're, you're watching this from the eyes of, I'm about to go do this. I got to see, like, I'm a singer who's dancing. Can I do, like, can I physically do this and handle this and learn three of them? Uh, but there's also this moment of like, what is this story? <laughs> and that was kind of where I had like, so I'm wondering, like, as you're watching it, that first view, you're trying to see probably way more detail than the average viewer. Cause you're picking up what you're about to go do, but how much of the story did you even attempt to figure out? From what I remember, it was definitely a case of like, uh, okay, here are all these vignettes that are leading up to um, an overarch overarching kind of reveal, which I think is, mm -hmm. uh, not, you know, not necessarily uh, a bad way to look at it from a first view. Um, obviously, then doing it for so long and kind of layering on all of the other elements. But even, you know, even the third or fourth and even the fifth time that I did the show, there was a whole bunch of new information that's like, oh, I, I've never known that in the, I don't know, seven, six, seven hundred performances I've done of the show. It's like, oh, I never knew that information. Yeah. So there's still always stuff that, you know, can be kind of mined and learned. And there's so much freedom and openness to kind of play with all of that. Um, but yeah, like the overarching with little, little, it's like the overarching umbrella of this magical night that somebody gets to go somewhere and the little vignettes of who's it going to be. I think that definitely came across. Um, but I was so razor focused. I'm like, I, can I, can I physically do this? Yeah. yeah. You're, you're watching the, the yeah, I did not. The, I was not looking at the forest and, for the trees. I was looking at the trees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. So then let's, let's talk a little bit about that first rehearsal process where you get in the cat's Bible, they're handing it to you, or at least they're probably telling if you said 12 of you, some variation of the story. Did you have an aha moment of like, wow, this is, I did not expect this. I didn't remember that. Like, what were the, the things that really surprised you about the story when you learned it? I think what surprised me, I think focusing on Jelly Lorem at first, um, focusing on it from the sort of, mothering sheltering protective warm kind of focus um i think that really helped in terms of 
understanding where everyone else's worldview of within the show kind of comes from because you're Hmm. as jelly you're you are watching everybody you're hoping you're wanting everything to go um to go the way it's supposed to reacting to all the interruptions um but also focusing so much on the younger generation coming up on all the kittens and seeing how they're kind of tapped into the importance um that was something that was really striking from the beginning um from focusing in that space that i thought was that yeah. that that definitely carried with me through through all of it interesting that's such a wholesome <laughs> and nice answer i'm always like i didn't know that the meter was right yeah by the later, like yeah. you know all these other things and there's just like oh the motherly aspect yeah. of taking care of the kittens i'm like all right that is okay um I want to hear a little bit. I'd love to hear some fun tour stories because oh, I know that, you know, that's a on the wild on the road because then I want to get sure, to your regional sure. experience after. So let's hear some, let's hear some of the U.S. tour stories. What do you remember? What stands out as like funny moments or just things you're never going to forget? There's from that a couple. Time on so tour? we were the year that um, in 2009, 2010 tour, we were branded as the tour of the Americas uh, because we spent a little time in Canada, but we also were in Central and South America. So um, a Mexican production company basically bought the tour for six weeks. And so we mm-hmm. were, um, yeah, we were in Central South America for six weeks. So we were in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, we were in uh, Bogota, Colombia, Medellin, Colombia, Panama City, Panama, and uh, San Jose, Costa Rica. Um and that was wild. <laughs> All of that, that whole time yeah. in South America was wild, especially like Venezuela really surprised me. I mean, I don't think you can really go anymore, which is pretty. Yeah. Sad, but even yeah. then in 2009, so that's what, 15 years ago, there were echoes of what is happening there now. We're already well in place. Yeah. So like we weren't allowed to leave the hotel by ourselves. Um, except to go to the mall that was like attached to it. And all the prices in the mall were insane. Like you went to, there was like a Wendy's in the food court and it would cost you $30 to get a meal. Um, Wow. Things like that. And this was the same, you did the, like your English version of it, right? There's no adjustments. They did have um, Spanish supertitles. So just like an opera where they have the supertitles projected, they had those for the Spanish speaking audiences. Because I know they did in, I think 2018 or 19, they did a tour in Mexico and- somewhere in Central America and they did it in yeah. Spanish. Like it was translated I mean, I in think different. Cats has been translated into like 25 or 30 languages over the years. Oh, yeah. yeah, tons. Um, but yeah, so we had, um, thankfully we didn't have to learn Spanish because I do not speak Spanish. <laughs> but yeah, it was super titled um, for the whole time we were down there. So when I was the vocal swing, I covered uh, Jelly Lorem, I covered Jenny Annie Dots, and I covered Grisabella. And um, in Caracas, we were playing this beautiful opera house and i was going on for grisabella which was scheduled uh we had a cra- pretty crazy schedule mm-hmm. we had a couple like three show days it was wild so they were wow. like, cycled out as many people as they could so everybody was on for two shows um so i was on for grisabella it was i think the second out of three shows and so we had a really quick meal break turnaround and the way that the the pod at the end of the show worked on our tour it was basically like um it was like a a half circle like a like a semicircle of the kind of the junk at the front and then the back was flat and open and it was basically a bicycle seat like you would get onto the pod from the tire they would connect you would sit on the bicycle Mm -hmm. seat you would put your hand through like you know you see like silks um or spanish web um acrobats and they had there's like a like a hand thing that you grab grab onto like a safety hand the stage manager would see you grab that and then they would cue you to fly out uh, and there was a phone so you could pick up and talk to the stage manager and check in. But you were you were back open to nothing. Like you were open. You were sitting on a bicycle seat, bicycle seat with your hand around a thing. And that was it. It was the only safety. There was no harness. You didn't clip in. Nothing. Wow. Up in the fly. In this theater, it was probably maybe 35 feet off the ground. And the automation okay. went down. So... Normally what happens is they all sing the finale and then in the beginning of bows, the pod comes all the way down to the floor. You step out, you leave stage, everybody bows, you get your bow. Done. The automation failed. So the pod did not come down. So I was 40 feet up in the rafters, watching everybody bow underneath me, everybody like looking up, seeing that I wasn't there. 
figuring out on the fly how to like cover the two eights of me not bowing and then finishing the show. And I was on the phone with the stage manager and she said, we have to get the cherry picker out to come and get you, but we have to wait until the house is clear, until everybody leaves. leaves, all 2000 people or however many were in the audience. So I sat up there for, I want to say it was like 15, maybe 20 minutes on a bicycle seat in full Grizabella with the heels and the coat and the long tail with nothing behind me open, just it, I could have swan, swan dove back onto the stage. It would have been (laughs) bad, but yeah, that was, um, that was something that was definitely a memorable experience. Yeah. I mean, those are, those things happen. I think it seems way more common or maybe it's not common, but when you do hundreds of performances, you just, you're going to have one that you happens and you always remember it. Um, but the amount of Grizabellas that have been stuck on that tire <laughs> that I've heard over yep. the years, it's like it's like it has to be part there of the There are show definitely fail safes. Point. There were fail safes for if the pod didn't come down. There were fail safes where if there were theaters where the pod wouldn't fit, you we cut the pod. Or if we cut the tire moving, like there were there were um contingencies for for pretty much everything. Um, even like in in the beginning of the show, if you're all the cats are on the on this on the um on the tire in the opening and a boot is supposed to drop from the fly. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes the mechanism fails. And so there, you know, there's a contingency for that. You look to the conductor, he makes everybody leave the stage, they reset it, and then we do it. <laughs> and that's what you do. So it literally oh, you basically wow. restart yeah. the show because you're in, you know, five minutes into the show. So thankfully there are all of those safety protocols that are through through, you know, thirty how many years ago? Thirty, forty, a lot of years. It's been 40 years. It's been years. over 40, yeah. been over 40, 40 now. Um, you know, because so much of it is so standardized, even in just in terms of naming the musical phrases, um, that that all of those sort of protocols have been, you know, are all well-worn paths. Yeah. Yeah, I always like the, I, I kind of joke the first time I heard, it, it's like, oh, the tire doesn't go up. It's like, well, Grisabella just like walks to the heavy side layer then, you know, instead of flies and there's, that's I think that's what makes theater great is that you are getting a different experience yeah. every show. And ideally, it's not something <laughs> breaks, but, but that's part of it is that you're seeing live. Like, it doesn't always go perfect. It's going to always yeah. be slightly different. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for more of The Wrong Cat Died. I want to hear about mm-hmm. the regional experiences now. So you, you finished the tour and I think you did it four times mm-hmm. uh, after. So walk me through them and like what, how long those were, when they were, what those experiences were like. Cause it's, it is different, right? Doing a sh- much yeah. shorter run than this tour where you're Absolutely. going to see the city. So, um, all four times that I did the show regionally was with, so actually all five times that I've done the show total was with the same two directors, was with Richard Stafford, who set the tour. Okay. And then I did, um, yep. two regional productions with him and Jacob Brent, who directed me three times, uh, all original choreography, um, and the first time that I did the show not on tour was with Jacob. And it was with a theater that is no longer around. Um, so I went in, auditioned for him. He saw it on my resume. We had a nice little chit-chat in the room. And then I got a call like a week later. Um, so doing the show with him after, I think it was... Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, how long so between finished, the tour I think it was and about show. a year. Okay, yeah, it was about a, it was 2000. Yeah, it was about a year. Um and there were a bunch of folks who did that production uh with us that had just finished that year's tour. So there were a lot of cats alums uh because it was such a short process. It was, you know, a standard regional rehearsal process is like two and a half, maybe three weeks if you're lucky. This was probably a two week process to do full original choreography. Um yeah. For how long though? So you do two weeks of rehearsal. Maybe and then is it four a month? weeks, four weeks, Couple maybe five months? weeks. Yeah. Short. Okay. Short. Um and so did the show with Jacob. And then that so that was in the fall of twenty eleven, in the, the summer of twenty thirteen. So it was about a year and a half later. I did the show with Richard and then with Jacob. So it was two different productions, uh, original choreography. Uh one was at th- Theater by the Sea with Richard. Um, and then, again, you know, two and a half weeks of rehearsal, about four weeks of shows. And then went up to um, Mary Garan Playhouse, which is now called The Rev, up near Syracuse um, with Jacob. Again, two-ish weeks of rehearsal, four-ish, maybe five-ish week of shows. 
And then, oh no, I missed one. The other one was in the, was Gateway. Gateway. Yeah, it's that was 2012. It was May of 2012. So that was about another five week process total. And that was with okay. Jacob. Yeah. So with these are all Jelly Lorem and I think some. Yes, they were all Jelly Lorem with Bridge Under Study. Yeah. So there's, you know, when you're doing this and you're, you're with the same directors, you're with Jacob, amazing mm-hmm. guests we had on and uh, the, one of the biggest wealth Incredible. of knowledge on cats I've ever met. Um, the, like how much of this is that it's like, it pops up and you see it and you audition or is it a, Hey, we're about to go do this. And Richard or Jacob are calling you saying, I need a Joey Lorem, you know, it let's, let's kind of audition for me, but it's kind of like asking you to at least con- sure. be considered been, in the process. I've been really, really fortunate in that once I had worked with Richard and once I had worked with Jacob, um, they basically asked me to do it. Um, Really yeah. fortunate to, you know, be able to have that kind of relationship with both of them. They're both wonderful uh, directors and wonderful people. And um, yeah, and that was a, yeah, just a really lovely to be thought of in that way and have your your name brought up in those rooms kind of thing. I've always wondered this because, again, I'm not a performer. I've never, I, I've done one thing in my entire life and I was like five. Um, is that there are, are there shows for you that you have done and it's like, I'd never want to do that again. And you don't have to, you don't have to call them out. And then there are other ones where it's like, you know what? If I see a Joey Lauren posting, I'm putting my name in the audition. Cause I lo- like, how does that work? Or is it much more of like, Hey, Jacob and Richard, they've got their, you know, five or six, not like individual, but people that they know that could do this. And they kind of go and encourage and find some new talent and all this stuff. But as a performer, like, do you, if you saw a casting for tomorrow for Joey Lauren, Imagine this was, you know, in the thick of things of doing that. Would you immediately be like, I'm ready? Like, I'm I'm going for that oh, audition yeah, right yeah, away. Yeah, for sure. Cats is one of those shows that really gets under your skin when you do it. Mm-hmm. With my background or very little background before doing the show, I always personally found it a lot more fun to do than it was to watch. But that's just me not growing up in the dance world. Um, yeah. yeah. A lot of people say that. And the show. there's something to do, I think, with the level of freedom and play that you have that it really it 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 gets under your skin and it's really hard to walk away from. So I think <laughs> it was very exciting to continually have the opportunity to play in that way that that doesn't happen a lot in this business. Um, there's not a lot of shows yeah. in which you have that much license every day that also has such a rich history. Like that's, it's, it's a very rare thing and it's a very exciting thing. And I think that contributes a lot to, you know, the way that people talk about the cat's family. Um, it gets under your skin and, and it's really hard to say goodbye to it. Yeah. So this has been a show that's like that. Has there been any in the, in the reverse where it's like, I did this one time and if I saw an addition, I'm not even put my name in. I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> Probably, yes. I, I, I'm not curious what the show is. I'm just more curious, like, in the idea of it. Like, is it like, hey, I just I'm, I just w- wouldn't want to do that again. And you don't have to say what show. I just am curious of, like, is that a thought process or is it a, this is work. And, you know, I, if they offered me the job, I'd probably consider it's, it's it. It's six of one, half a dozen of the other. I mean, I think some of those things is, okay. is you know, you, you do the mental math of, is this is this process for this potential project worth what I would get out of it? I think that's 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 the consistent mental for math sure. you do in this business okay. all the time. Whether it's you're doing it for the yeah. health weeks for the union or you're doing it for the pay or you're doing it to work with somebody specifically or you're doing it to work at a theater specifically. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. it's a whole bunch of mental math you have to do every time you walk in the room. For sure. Okay, I want to go back mm-hmm. to the regional experiences. You're doing mm-hmm. a two-week rehearsal or maybe maybe three at most, versus your much longer process for the tour. How deep does a Jacob and a Richard go into the story in that those different productions for, I mean, obviously you said there's a lot of alums. So most of you know it and have a pretty good idea, but there's definitely not all alum. There's going to be some where this is the mm-hmm. first time they've ever done it. So how much do you get into that in rehearsal of a regional production Versus the tour. From my experiences um, working with Richard and Jacob, they do as much world building as time allows. By that, I mean 
the first um the first week of rehearsal you'll take the first maybe the first hour to do you know cat work as it were we used to call it felinity yeah. like you're you are yep in your you know you're reacting to stimulus of somebody throwing a water bottle and you're all reacting or uh, uh solidifying those relationships or sitting in a circle and talking or um i know um you were speaking with jacob about the three words that he likes to give everybody for their specific characters yep. and about kind of internalizing that for what that means for you and, and using those things. So I'd say, uh, and with, with Richard, it was very much like he would lead a group warm up for everybody every day, like a physical dance warm up. And then we would start to work okay. in some of those felinity ways. You do what you can with the time that you have, because there's still so much material that goes through. And of course, every director has their little bits that they like to do differently or set differently or constraints of the space is always a big thing. Or if the set is different from, you know, it's not it's not the the oven and the tire and the um the plank. It's uh, it's a um, it's the back of a bus or it's some other concept that the scenic designer had that you're now adjusting yeah. what you're used to versus what the constraints are around you. Um, yeah. So that was a, those have all been fascinating and challenging. But the core of it, the core uh, work that you do to to tell the story is is paramount is is paramount it's important and it's every time that i've done it has been treated with a lot of care and respect mm -hmm. that makes sense do you remember the three words i have i think not. my three words for jelly been a long time <laughs> i want to say my three words were something along the lines of like protector mother and um caregiver or something along those lines i have so this is just yeah. what's on the Cats Wikipedia page. So I'm not sure if it's perfectly accurate, but it has practical, busy, and cheery. Okay. For okay. Joey Laura. I don't know if I ever necessarily got those ones specifically. Maybe and it's been, just, you know, yeah. my, maybe my brain has blocked them. <laughs> to be fair, I'm not even sure that these are right. This is just what sure. the one website is. And it's based on one piece of paper that someone asked. So it's like, it could have been this sure. production sure, sure, or sure. who knows. Um, I want to ask a little bit, can you tell me more about Griddlebone? <laughs> Griddlebone is Gus's fantasy life. The, the, the Growl Tiger Griddlebone opera, which isn't in the movie. It's not even really in the show anymore. It's gone. It's gone, it's gone yeah. from, I think it's even gone from like the cruise ship. Um, oh, definitely. Cruise ship cut out. Cruise ship's oh, down to 90, 90 minutes, minutes now. So yeah. it's. It's a yep. one, no intermission, yep. 90 minute. Yeah, yep. so that was definitely um, cut. It's his, it's his fantasy. It's his reliving his experiences in his last hurrah. Um, and because mm -hmm. Gus has this, such this close relationship with Jelly, and Jelly really does, you know, take care of him, make, sh make sure that he eats, you know, make sure he's been grooming himself. Like those, she's his caretaker. She loves him in the way that caretakers love their, the people they um, take care of, that he has kind of projected, it, it, this is the way that I've always thought of it, that he's always projected his moments of glory and it, is inserting the people from his current sphere into his memories. You know, so Griddlebone mm, okay. is, Growl Tiger Griddlebone was, you know, his tour de force when he was a young spry cat. Um, He's probably had so many cats that he played Girl Tiger and Griddlebone with. At the moment, it's Jelly because that's who he's with all the time. And that's who he loves as his caretaker. And so it's easy just to be like, oh, I'm going to plug in this face that I see all the time. That's kind of where it lands for me uh, because she is so opposite to Jelly. And it is, you know, this kind of comic operatic turn. And from this place of real, you know, from the song of Gus, it's such a a tender, real, simple, straightforward, loving moment that you don't get anywhere else in the show. Um, mm -hmm. That to have the juxtaposition of this grand, over-the-top memory play that um, shows how far Gus has come and how much he's lost um, that I yeah. think is the biggest case for him to be chosen. It's such an interesting piece because it's not been in the version I've seen besides the 1998 movie. And there's not a lot like written on it because it's like, it is this little mm -hmm. scene within a scene. 
Um, but then it's also, it's listed as like, mm-hmm. you played Griddlebone too. And so it's always kind of like this weird one of, do you get a lot of information on Griddlebone or is it just like, no, you're Joey Lorem and now you're acting in this little scene. Pretty much, yeah. It. It's 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 this um, comic okay. opera off to the side as part of Gus's fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do cool. some rapid fire. Let's get to the the important important question here at the end. So if you could go on tomorrow, male, female, any cat, it doesn't matter whether you could do it or not. Who would you want to do one night as? Bomb. Oh God, I love Bomb Ballerina. She is so sexy and fun. I've always wanted to play Bomb. Oh, it's God, such a great song. So good. The cavity is so and fun. just all of her, you know, chasing after Tugger and fawning over him, and then still getting her power back from him at the end. Like it's it's just so fun, just to be that sort of sexy bombshell. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Who are your favorite and least favorite characters? So which cats do you love? Which one kind of bug you? I think uh, least favorite is, I'm probably going to say Tumble Brutus because just from a perspective of Jelly Lorem, he's the biggest pain in her butt, <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, this kid again. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's definitely that kind of energy. Um, favorite is probably, I would say Old Dude or Syllabub. Syllabub has this this beautiful channeling energy of simplicity and honesty and openness and youth and it's because of old dude that she is this conduit so i think those are those are (laughs) two together that i think are are yeah that yeah yeah okay uh favorite song in the show i will say i still wake up sometimes with skimble shank stuck in my head and it's been 10 years since the last (laughs) the show so probably who does it (laughs) okay I always like to ask one fun one, and I, I kind of kept thinking back to your your Central America, South America kind of like touring piece, and I want to modernize it a little bit. So which cat do you think would have made the most out of that moment of turning it into like an influencer moment? So they would have been roaming around Central and South America, getting their TikToks, <laughs> and so which one do you think would be best oh, at doing funny. that on Who tour? Who would be best at being a TikTok influencer? I think, I think there's two choices here. I think Jenny Anydots would do her best. <laughs> I think she would really try. Oh, interesting. She would be doing it on like Facebook Live. Um, yeah. Or I think Mungo and Rump as well. They'd be good. They'd be good. I They were, I had Bomba uh-huh. and Tiger. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I could see the two of them, but Mungo and Rump and Victoria, I'm sure would figure out, but I feel like those two would be finding the beaches oh, yeah. where they could. Yeah. And then Mungo and Rump would be, Mungo and Rump would yeah. be highlighting all the nightlife. For sure. Yeah, sneaking oh, yeah. out of your For hotel. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Most important question. So I've argued at length that I don't think Grizabella is the right joke of choice. So I want to hear, do you, Lucy, do you, not Joey Larm, do you, Lucy, who are you picking as your joke of choice? Well, there's two ways it can go. If Grizz doesn't show up, it's Gus. It has to be, right? He's ancient. He's lived okay. his life. He's gone yeah. through everything. He's fulfilled every expectation placed on him and has, and he's not going to make it to another one. So Gus, I think, is yeah. the obvious choice. Um, with Grizz showing up, with Dute being there, with all of the interruptions and challenges and McCavity and, and, and everything there, um, the way that every cat on that stage has been changed by that evening. I think, I think it is Grizabella is the only rash uh, for me, Lucy. That is the choice. Is there a world where she doesn't come? Like you're, I, I never mm. considered that a, an option. I think if Dute didn't show up, she wouldn't show up. Or if Dute didn't show up, she'd show up once, be chased off and wouldn't come back. Does he not show up every year though? I don't think so. Okay, so he's not doing this every year. It's in that the off years that he's not there is Monk. Yeah, I think he's the he's the he's the he's the one who is in charge ninety eight percent of the time. He's he's the cat that you know makes sure all of the um the you know he's he's running the the Google note and the Google Doodle and has everybody's calendar synced and makes sure that everybody's responded and has sent out you know all the lists of. Uh, 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 vendors to supply, and he's 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 the stage. He's the he's yeah. the, the the front man. He's the the one who is 
giving the TED Talk and has organized the convention at the same time. Like that is Monk 98% of the time. Um, Because everybody is shocked and surprised and elated when Dude shows up. When the moment yeah. that, uh, I believe it's Mistopheles says Old Deuteronomy, when the the magic cats have kind of ch- sensed a change in the air, um, we all can't believe it. You know, we don't know if it's true. We don't know if your eyes are deceiving you. You don't know who you are or where you're coming from. So to have him come to this important special night is the catalyst that changes a lot of things. Um, because mm-hmm. Christabel has already showed up once and we all said, get the heck out of here. We've chased her off and said, no, said we're, no, we're not yeah. doing any, remark the cat. We're not doing any of this. We want you gone. We don't care who you are. Or you left us. You're gone. Um, but she keeps coming back because she knows dude's there. I think, um, she keeps trying because for her, there is no other chance. Um, and dude is the one that makes that possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, so I, I, that makes sense. I didn't think about, I never thought about her not coming back because I just assume that she's part of this, this evening that we're getting no matter what. And I guess I've always just taken for granted that mm-hmm. dude's there and he's not, could possibly not have been there or isn't yeah. there every year. And so that's kind of where I've, that, that make that all makes sense. And that's where it's like, she has to be chosen. But I do wonder like my argument, and I've said this on almost every episode for the, probably the last hundred why can't she just stay next year and be next year's choice? I think in the same way that there's not a next year for Gus, I don't think there's a next year for Grisabella. She's she's okay. she's been she's through done. it. Even her coming back and singing memory, she falls to the ground and it's she's she is done. If if Lil Syllabub doesn't start singing, you know, Sunlight Through the Through the Dawn is breaking, she wouldn't get back up. She would be done. That would be it. Mm-hmm. She's giving every last ounce of what she has left to plead her case in the one chance she's been given so i don't think there is an next year for grisabella okay so what about this particular scenario because now i'm thinking about it from a different angle what if she doesn't come back does old duke come this year for gus or is he out? i think i don't think duke shows up because he knows grisabella's been sniffing around i think he shows up because he is ethereal spirit of the tribe who kind of comes and goes on his own timetable he's okay so these are i think unrelated. they're unrelated i think i think i think it's un i think dute's appearance is unrelated to grizabella's reappearance if that makes sense but yeah but she doesn't actually come back a second time or, th- or third and third if or dute's fourth not whatever there. that's what if i he's think. not there yeah. mm-hmm. interesting okay okay mm-hmm. lots to think about Always something, always different experiences. I, I'm still, you haven't changed my mind, <laughs> but I do, I do uh, respect <laughs> the opinion and the thought. And it is, I, you know, I always do forget that old mm-hmm. dude's not always there. Cause I just, I, I just take for granted that it's like, he's, I kind of jokingly feel he's a serial killer. That's like every year he comes back and, and acts as somebody. Well, it's one, yeah, one night, one night a year, every year. It's, it's also it. interesting though, doing the show for so long. It's it's very easy to take for granted the fact that Dude shows up every day. As you yeah. know, you're doing the show eight times a week for however long, whether it's a one month stint on a regional gig or a year on tour or, you know, how long did Jacob do Broadway? Like eight years. Um, and then some. Yeah. And it's it's easy to for those magical things that affect the story that we are telling because it is it it can be it can be taken as pretty thin on the ground um it's easy to take those things for granted and the audience misses out the ones who are consuming the Mm -hmm. story miss out on the wonder and the details if we miss out on those things for sure yeah because it's so thin like you said it's there's not it's not told it's not spoken it's kind of implied in a lot of places so if you don't bring that energy and aspect to it, then there are going to be people that miss it. And some people are going to miss it anyways, but that's, I think the beauty of the show is that there's a whole, you know, an incredible dance component that somebody can walk in and just watch the dancing and not even know the names of the cats and still be fine. 
someone could love the singing and hear all the different songs and walk out. I was still, I mean, I, for a good week after seeing a show the very first time, I sang Love of Jerry Rumble Teaser. <laughs> That's stuck in my head for at least a week. Um, and then there's the story and there is like a lot of extra and there's a whole, I mean, a whole Wikipedia fan page of theories and stuff. And I'm now 160 plus episodes digging into those. And so it's like, there's a mm -hmm. lot there that you can really enjoy and appreciate of this show in all kinds of different forms, which is probably why it's so successful. I think it, yeah, and I think it, it transcends language. It transcends, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't matter where you are on your life journey. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, how you love, whatever. There's something in there for everybody. And I think that that kind of even like, yep. harkens back to what I said before about the show gets under your skin and it's really yeah. hard to walk away from that. Yeah. Wow. This has been super fun. Uh, how can people stay in touch with you on social media and um, keep yeah, up with so, everything? Yeah, um, so my, all my socials are at LF Horton. So at L for Lucy, F for Francis, and my last name Horton, H-O-R-T-O-N, like the elephant. And that's me on all the socials. Yeah. All right. We will link that. And uh, thank you oh, thanks so for much having for coming me. on and oh, for sharing sure. your experience. It was awesome. Thank you, and thanks everyone else for listening to this episode of The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown on the cast history. To follow along, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or right, also listen to podcasts. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and threads at The Wrong Cat Died, or check our website, thewrongcatdied.com. Bye.